possible difficulties, but I think we've got it all figured out now. Um, so, hi, welcome. Uh, my name is Elon Kadunin, and this will be a talk about some of the world's most famous unsolved codes. Uh, here we have a picture of Kryptos, which is at the center of CIA headquarters. That's also the Voynich manuscript at the top right. I maintain a list of the world's most famous unsolved codes at my website, elonka.com. Um, and um, I've uh, got somewhat of a name for cracking codes in the hacker scene. Um, I've actually cracked so many codes I've been banned from competition in the challenges. For example, at the Atlant Atlanticon uh, convention when they released a code, it was on a sheet of paper and it said at the bottom, note, past puzzle solvers are ineligible for prizes associated with solving the Atlanticon challenge. Give someone else a chance, Ilanka. So, um, <laughs> I cracked that one too, and uh, <laughs> somebody was really mad at me, but I cracked it. So, um, along with this, I uh, people were asking me like, you know, what are the codes that haven't been solved? Haven't been solved? Like, I don't know. So I went and I did the research on it, and I came up with the list, and I posted on my website, and it just got millions of of hits. It, it, it's crazy how many people are visiting my website, um, and. Um, in the uh, one of the codes, one of the hacker codes that I cracked, which is called the Freaknik 3 Challenge. Freaknik, that's with a P-H-R-E-A-K. It's a, uh, from a convention in Nashville, a hacker con. Uh, their next one will actually be coming up soon, November 3rd through 5th. I will be there. I'm on the board for that convention now. And um, through cracking the Freaknik 3 code, there were some dead ends in it, some red herrings. And one of them was, go crack this. And it was a link to the CIA website. Um, where the CIA had pictures of a sculpture that was at the center of CIA headquarters called Kryptos, and that's number five there now. And Kryptos is a challenge to the employees at the CIA. It was installed about 20 years ago, and it's got four codes on it. Three of the four have been solved. The fourth has not been solved yet, and it's considered to be one of the most famous unsolved codes in the world. So as I was solving the Freaknik 3 code, I was like, okay, linked to crypto, so yeah, ha ha, this is one of the world's most famous unsolved codes, but that's where I got really interested in it. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about crypto, so I'm also going to be talking about probably the most famous unsolved code, which is the Beale ciphers, um, and then also one another one very famous called the Voynich manuscript, which is a 500-year-old manuscript. And way at the end there, also in orange, I have something called the Friedman tombstone, which is a, a code that I, I cracked just a few months ago. And I wouldn't say it was one of the most famous codes, but it was an interesting story. So uh, I'll be going over that briefly. Um, so this is the Beale ciphers. This is a pamphlet that was published in the late 1800s that purported to tell about a treasure that had been buried um, between 1819 and 1821. And it enclosed some encrypted messages, three encrypted messages. And one of them uh, purported to say, OK, where the treasure was buried. And another purported to say who it belonged to. And then a third one kind of told a little bit about the story, about what had been buried. So the again, according to the pamphlet, everything we know about is according to this one pamphlet. According to the pamphlet, the um, uh, this was a man named Thomas Beale, and he and some gentleman adventurers had gone in the early 1800s from Virginia out to the west, to the great wild west, where they'd gone out to hunt buffalo. And uh, they'd kind of run across, the, in, a, in a canyon, they'd run across a, some gold and silver. Uh, and they mined it. They mined it for a year and a half. And then they decided, what are we going to do with all this gold and silver? And they chose one of their members to pile it all up in a wagon and take it back to Virginia near their homes and bury it. And, and then when they were done all of their, their adventuring in the Southwest, they would go back to this area, uh, Lynchburg, Virginia, and uh, near a, a tavern, Buford's Tavern, and then they would dig it up and distribute it among their families. So um, this, it's a very famous uh, cipher. If you're ever on, a, if you're on Netflix, you can find it on Myth Hunters. There was a series about it. I was one of the talking heads there. I like this picture. I, you can't see it. Can we lower some of the, the lights by any chance? This was actually in a hotel room. We made a hotel room into a studio. So if you look at it, you can see that there's kind of the, the chest of drawers. And then behind me is the door that leads into the other hotel room. And, and so it was all really tight, like my elbow was on the bed. But, uh, but they made it look really cool in the actual series. Um, so um, 
I think I've told you about all that, and yeah, I told you about that. Um, and so a man named Thomas Beale, he concealed the treasure, gave the papers in an iron box in 1822 to the innkeeper, Robert Morris, and then he went away. Um, he sent a letter a few months later, but then he vanished. Now the instructions he'd given to the innkeeper was, if I don't return after a certain period of time, open the box, and you'll see the messages in the box. And um, it took 22 years, but the innkeeper opened the box and he found these three ciphers. He didn't really do much with it, uh, but again, all of this according to the pamphlet. Decades later, Morris gave the box to an unnamed friend who cracked one of the ciphers in there, paper number two, which he cracked. It was a book cipher using the Declaration of Independence, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how that worked. Then this unnamed friend wrote a pamphlet, um, which he published in 1885, and then he said, I'm washing my hands of the entire story. So this was paper number two. It was a series of numbers, lots and lots of numbers. And in a, I don't know if you'll be able to see this in the back, but this is the beginning of the Declaration of Independence. You know, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which uh, have connected them with another. So you take the numbers from the ciphers, so like 115, 73, 24, and you go to the different words of the Declaration of Independence. So word 115 is instituted. So you take the first letter there, which is I, and then you go to the 73, you go to the 73rd word, hold, and you take the first letter H. And so doing that, you get I-H-A-V-E, I have. I have deposited in the county of Buford, Bedford, about four miles from Buford's, in an excavation or vault six feet below the surface of the ground, the following articles belonging jointly to the parties whose names are given in number three herewith. The first deposit consisted of 1,014 pounds of gold and 3,812 pounds of silver deposited November 1819. The second was made December 1821 and consisted of 1,907 pounds pounds of gold and 1,288 pounds of silver, also jewels obtained in St. Louis in exchange for silver to save transportation and valued at $13,000, which would be hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. The above is securely packed in iron pots with iron covers. The vault is roughly lined with stone and the vessels rest on solid stone and are covered with others. Paper number one describes the exact locality of the vault so that no difficulty will be had in finding it. So this is paper number one. Again, lots of numbers. So this unnamed friend was unable to find anything to crack this, and many people have spent a lot of time with this, and many people who didn't want to decipher it but just wanted to look have descended on Bedford County with shovels, and they have dug holes <laughs> all around the area but have not found anything. This is paper number three, which supposedly has the names and residences of those to whom this treasure belongs. So was it a treasure or was it a hoax? A lot of people have uh, written stuff about this for over 100 years now. Um, so maybe it was a hoax because there's talk in the pamphlet about how did they find this, this mine. Well, they'd been, it said they'd been driven into this ravine because of a stampede. Well, stampede really wasn't a commonly used word in that time. So maybe it means that the pamphlet was written far later in time than actually what was purported there. It's also kind of a questionable story. Okay. Three wagons full of gold were shipped all the way back from the west to Virginia. Why Virginia? I mean, there's banks, there's all kinds of places. You can, St. Louis, perfectly good city. Also, the idea of a group of 30 men mining gold for 18 months and no word gets out. I mean, if you've ever studied the actual the miners, the 49ers, that secret did not last long. <laughs> that secret got out very, very quickly. So these are things that kind of put the whole story into question. Also, the idea that paper number three included the names and residences of all these 30 men. Well, the names and residences of all these men, well, paper number three only has 618 characters in it. So it's kind of suspicious that that much could have been hidden in such a small message. It is possible. There's types of ciphers where you can do that. But it, just, it does add a question mark. There's just a picture of number three. 
So <clears throat> the one of the theories now is that the paper, the pamphlet, did have another author. There's a man named John William Sherman who was a playwright and a journalist, and he did live in the area. He, he had many family connections to, to Ward and to Buford's Tavern, and he had purchased a newspaper in the area, the Lynchburg Virginian newspaper, in 1885. And that newspaper ran into some financial difficulties. So it's possible that Sherman came up with a way to kind of help the paper's financial difficulties. So for example, there's this little ad for the pamphlet, the Beale Papers, containing authentic statements, price 10 cents this ad was ran 84 times but only in the virginia newspaper not in any other newspaper also at the very bottom where it says address ww watts at 1001 main street ww watts was the name of a paper boy who worked for the virginian so it's just one of those things that kind of adds suspicion so we don't know so possibly also it has something to do with the Freemasons because many of the people involved with this were Masons and Freemasonry, and that's a whole other talk I give, is um, often involved with the quest, the quest for information. And there is a, a Masonic fable that has to do with this, the farmer and his sons. So I'll read it. A farmer being at death's door and desiring to impart to his sons a secret of much moment called them round him and said, my sons, I am shortly about to die. I would have you know, therefore, that in my vineyard there lies a hidden treasure. Dig, and you will find it. So as soon as their father was dead, the sons took spade and fork and turned up the soil of the vineyard over and over again in their search for the treasure which they supposed to lie buried there. They found none. However, but the vines, after so thorough a digging, produced a crop such as had never before been seen. So, so it, it's this thing of seeking and looking for the answer to these ciphers and some of these other ciphers I'll talk about. Often the quest for the cipher is more valuable than anything that you m might find as an answer. So next, this is the Friedman tombstone. This is something that, that I did just a few months ago. So William and Elizabeth Friedman are the founders of American cryptology from, early from the early 1900s. They met at a place called Riverbank Laboratories. This was a, uh, something that was built by a man named George Fabian, who called himself Colonel George Fabian. And he, he was a millionaire and very eccentric. So he would kind of name research topics. And even for the building, what he did is he called an architect into his room and he piled up a bunch of cigar boxes on the table and he said, build me a building that looks like that. And so that's exactly what they did, is make a building <laughs> that looked like a bunch of cigar box piled up. And they would come up with these, the, he would just come up with research topics. For example, he wanted to say that William Shakespeare had not really written his works. They were really written by Francis Bacon. He also wanted to do genetics research and research the effect of moonlight on plant growth. So he would hire people and say, well, you just plant a bunch of plants in, you know, under different phases of the moon and see how it does. And they were getting paid and they said, okay, we'll do it. So one of the uh, genetics researchers was William Friedman and one of the women who was working on the, the Shakespeare project, they met, they fell in love, so they were love at Riverbank, and they got married in April 1917. So Elizabeth Friedman, brilliant woman, she was the one that actually really taught cryptography, the, the process of looking for codes and secret messages, for example, in the works of Shakespeare, she taught them to William. So they got married in April 1917, and then World War I. United States enters the war in May of 1917. There really wasn't any crypto office at the time, so Colonel George Fabian says, here, take some of my researchers. So William and Elizabeth created a department of cryptology. They created a course in order to teach um, crypt cryptographers for the World War I effort. And they, they created the cur curriculum and all. And so in this class picture of this first class of World War I cryptographers, there's actually a code hidden in this picture. If you look at them, some of them are facing forward and some are facing to the side. And that's a code, and it's the Bacon cipher, actually. And it spells out the message, knowledge is power. So William Friedman kept that message on his desk for the rest of his life. This is a quick picture of the Baconian cipher. So if you look here, there is the picture, which he kept on his desk forever. So knowledge is power was a big 
a, a very important phrase in the lives of the Freedmans. Codes were so entwined in their lives, they even sent out Christmas invitations that were in cipher. You had to solve the cipher in order to figure out where to go for, for the Christmas party. Okay, so the, uh, and then Elizabeth went on to crack a ton of codes. As I said, she was a brilliant woman. She was the America's first great female cryptanalyst. And she would crack the codes of Nazis, drug sm smugglers, World War I spies. The Coast Guard hired her. And she, she would just crack them, one after another. There's a new book coming out about her called The Woman Who Smashed Codes. And that will be coming out later this year. So, um, and then they also proved that Bacon did not write Shakespeare's plays, and they wrote a book in 1957. So when uh, William died first, and when he died, Elizabeth was left to design his tombstone. And so she put at the top a pair of cross flags, which was his, his unit, and she put his name and the dates, and then she left a space for her own name, and then she put at the very bottom the phrase, knowledge is power. Now, when I, I just moved to Maryland uh, late last year, and when I was there, I wanted to go see the grave of William and Elizabeth Friedman. So I went to Arlington Cemetery. This is a massive cemetery. It's a national shrine, over 400,000 graves. And I went to find his tombstone, and I had to walk and walk and walk. And then I found in a little corner of Arlington Cemetery, I found the grave with now William and Elizabeth's name. She passed away in 1980. And at the bottom, the phrase, knowledge is power. But on a closer look, there was a code hidden in the phrase, knowledge is power. If you look closely, like look at the E's, here there's an E and here there's an E, and you see there's a difference between the two E's. This E has the little things at the, at the end of it, which means it's a different font. That's the serif, serif. So if you've ever had a font in a sans serif font, this is a sans serif, sans serif, without serif font. So if you go through and you look at, okay, K has the serifs, okay, N doesn't, O does, we'll leave that, but it does, W does not, doesn't, 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 does, doesn't, does, no, no, yes, no, yes, no. So if you look at it that way, and instead of saying yes, no, yes, no, we'll call them A, B, A, B. So something with, we'll call it a B, so we have B, A, B, A, 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 B, A, B. And then you compare it to the Bacon cipher. So this is a W, F, F. She hid her husband's initials on the tombstone, W, F, F. So it was just a, a nice little romantic thing. And no one found that until I found it uh, earlier this year. So it's maybe not a super famous cipher, but, uh, but it's a story that I enjoy telling. And so now something else that the Freedmans did and their group did is when they weren't cracking government and military ciphers, they were also looking at famous historical ciphers, some of which they cracked, some of which they didn't. One of the ones that they spent a lot of time looking at was this one called the Voynich Manuscript. So this is a manuscript 500 years old, hundreds of pages, very strange diagrams in it, also pictures of little people here and there. And, um, generations people have been looking at it. The reason it's called the Voynich Manuscript is because it was brought to public attention in 1912 by uh, Wilfred Voynich. He was a Polish-American uh, bookseller who found it in, uh, in, the, in a box of a, a, a monastery was selling books. They were running low on money and so they were kind of discreetly selling off some of their library. And he saw it and he thought it was interesting. He called it the ugly duckling of the batch. Uh, and he purchased it and tried to crack it. The, uh, the place where he bought it was the Villa Mondragoni, which was near Rome. Um, and that, if you've heard Villa Mondragoni, it's the place where the uh, Gregorian uh, calendar w was declared there. OK. All right, this is other pic. I'll just kind of go through these quickly. Other pictures of the Voynich. It has been carbon dated to the early 1400s. It's no recognized language. We don't even recognize the alphabet of it. And there's plants, but the plants are unusual. We can't recognize the plants. Some of them look similar, but we can't tell. And then there's pictures of little women in little tubs of green water, and we don't know what those mean either. Right. So the plants, and, and here's, here's an example of the alphabet if we translated it in, into our Roman alphabet. 
And it sort of looks like a language, but again, we can't translate it. Is it a cipher? Is it a secret language? We don't know. It does look, the book does look similar to what's called a, an, an herbal, which is something that you know, has pictures of different herbal, different uh, kinds of plants and their medicinal properties, but, uh, but it's not. For example, we have this flower, I believe it's called the, the passion flower, and these are pictures of what the flowers look like. And you see they've got 10 petals. In the Voynich manuscript, they have five. And you see the leaves that normally is, but these are not the leaves that would go with that flower. So was someone playing with alchemy? Were they trying to mix and match? Uh, we don't know. Uh, I did get a chance to see it myself at a very rare time. It was, uh, it's normally held at the uh, Yale uh, University Beinecke Rare Books Library, um, but it was a out on exhibition once at the uh, Shakespeare Library, so I got a chance to see it. I've actually created my own replica of the Voynich Manuscript, page by page, figuring out which goes on the reverse of which. Um, hasn't helped me at all, but it was kind of a fun, fun project. <laughs> I, I did find it interesting when I actually got to see it, the way that some of these pages were kind of folded over. It doesn't look like a typical manuscript with, with carefully cut pages or anything. So again, maybe that's a clue, maybe not. I enjoy sharing information about these codes to other smart people, such as are at Dragon Con, hoping that maybe somebody will see something and they'll have a, a spark and they'll want to work on it and you know, solve it. I, I just love sharing the information. This is one of the most famous pages of the Voynich Manuscript. It's called the Rosette page. It folds out and um, <laughs> it sort of looks like a map. Um, there's buildings in it. It looks, maybe it looks like a microscope looking at different things. There's all kinds of different theories. One is interesting here. There's, it's sort of like looking down from a high point and looking down and seeing buildings all around you in an interesting perspective. But there's a, a castle on its side right there. And, and the, the battlements of the castle are very interesting because they're not just square wave. These, they have these little squiggles in them, which is called a swallowtail merlon. And there are castles that do have that kind of architectural element. Now today they're all over the place, but at the time we believed the Voynich manuscript was created, it was generally around northern Italy in that area. So that may, may give a clue as to where the Voynich manuscript was created. So um, what is it? I mean, it was sold to the Emperor Rudolph for 600 gold duca, around $80,000 today. Um, and, and so maybe, Maybe it was created as a way to separate Emperor Rudolph from 600 gold duka. <laughs> Maybe it was created as a hoax. Maybe it was someone who was schizophrenic and created. Maybe it was just a, a work of art. But you got to think, I mean, every, every lane we go down, there's something like, OK, well, maybe it was a hoax. Well, who created it? And that's a lot of work they put into that kind of a hoax. Maybe it was created by someone who was schizophrenic. Well, if it was someone who was schizophrenic, they were with a very wealthy family because they had access to many, many pages of this, and it was animal skin. I believe, I believe it was goat skin, um, and they had access to the inks and the dyes. And but okay, so maybe they were in a wealthy family. And then what about all these plants? Was it alchemy? Were they? We don't know. There's just so many questions about it. So it's called the world's most mysterious manuscript. Um, maybe it, uh, the Freedmans, when they looked at it, they thought it was an artificial language. That's a theory as good as any. Um, maybe it's encrypted. Maybe some family was selling uh, potions. If it was made in the 1400s, uh, you got to think, okay, we're about 100 years after the Black Death in the 1300s, so people were very interested in purchasing medicinal ointments. Uh, and the ointments, the, the price of the ointments was generally directly related to the rarity of the herbs that was in the ointments. So maybe someone had this as sort of a sales catalog, like, look, these are the herbs, very rare, comes from far away, you've never seen anything like this, right? And that means that the ointments are you know, very expensive, very expensive. That's a possibility as good as any other. Um, again, the world's most mysterious manuscript. 
So uh, just very briefly, this is another code. These were disks that were found uh, on one of the islands south of Italy um, in some Greek ruins. Uh, and it's just a lot of symbols very carefully stamped into this clay disk. We have no idea what they say. We've never seen any other alphabet like that. Crete, that's where it was discovered, early 1900s. So there's a sort of alphabet to it, about 45 symbols. It might relate to one of the other systems. There's linear A and linear B languages. We, we know what linear B says. We don't know what linear A says yet. Or maybe just someone made it for religious purposes or or maybe it was a game. <laughs> maybe it was a board game of some sort. We don't know. We don't know. Uh, another famous cipher, this one was created by the composer Edward Elgar. Uh, the pomp and circumstance. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I, you probably know it. Okay. So he had uh, written a message to a young friend. And when he sent a message to her aunt, I believe, and this was in the 1800s, he said, oh, by the way, pass this along to Dorabella. And it looks like your standard substitution cipher. She was never, she was never able to solve it. Um, she contacted him and he said, I'm surprised given all that we've spoken about that you've never been able to solve that. Uh, and uh, late in her life, she wrote her memoir and she published this and she, she said, I'd appreciate if someone could tell me what it might say. We still don't know. And there's the Zodiac ciphers. These are from California, the serial killer. Some, some of you may have seen the movie about this guy who would go and he would find people in remote areas in California and, and kill them. He made several murders and he would send messages to the newspapers and he would taunt them. And he would say, if you can solve this message, it will tell you who I am. And one of these was cracked very quickly by a couple readers of the newspaper. It didn't say anything about his specific name. It was just gruesome stuff, like I like killing people. Um, so um, we have these other messages that are numbered, I think, by the, the quantity, of quantity of characters that are in them. There's uh, wonderful websites you can go to where you can see the rest of the messages. If this is something you want to work on, um, have at it. This is one of the, one of the good websites. For example, zodiackiller.com is one of these websites. So uh, going on to the CI's crypto sculpture, this is one of my favorites. This is a sculpture at the center of CIA, about 12 feet tall, about 20 feet long. Um, you can see letters that are carved into it. These are carved through it, so you can actually see the plants on the other side of the sculpture. Um, it was installed when the CIA was creating a new headquarters building, and uh, they needed art. And uh, so they created a committee, which created a committee, which created a committee, which chose um, artists, uh, the uh, art and architecture program. And they chose this man named Jim Sanborn to create it. They, he had done other art. Um, he liked doing things with invisible forces. Uh, he liked to make things that were hidden visible. For example, you would go into one of his installations and you might see hundreds of needles that were each hanging by a single string from the ceiling. And all of these needles, even though they weren't touching anything, were all pointing in the same direction because there was a lodestone at the far end of the room. So that he was trying to show the lines of magnetic force. And so he did this with magnetism. He did it with the Coriolis force. Um, he did it with um, lightning, things that were building up to lightning and many other things. And so the committee that was trying to uh, find artists uh, to put sculptures around the CIA building liked that he was doing this invisible forces because they felt that it tied in well with the mission of the CIA, making things invisible, visible. So um, Sanborn came in. He did a little research about the CIA. He'd, he'd, uh, he'd never done anything with text before, but he decided he wanted to do a sculpture called Kryptos, which is Greek for the word hidden, and um, to have some uh, secret messages on it. So the director of the CIA at the time, a man named William Webster, uh, teamed Sanborn with Ed Scheidt. Ed Scheidt was the chairman of the CI Cryptographic Center, and Ed taught Sanborn about codes. And, um, and then Ed came up with the messages, or Jim came up with the messages, Sanborn came up with the messages, and carved them in. It was a process that took a couple years. So um, these are rubbings of the sculpture. 
obtained by me after a great deal of effort. I had wanted to see the crypto sculpture as, as soon as I heard about it from Freaknik. And um, it was, I was in Washington, D.C. It actually ties in with September 11th. I, had, uh, I was living in St. Louis at the time, and September 11th happened. And I knew that I had a cousin named Nick who was in Washington, D.C. He was actually supposed to be in the Pentagon on that morning. But um, he was running late because he had printer problems. And as he got those problems fixed, he's heading towards the Pentagon. He was checking his phone for messages. His phone actually crashed from all the messages from people who were saying, a plane just hit the Pentagon. Don't go. Um, so um, some of the people he was supposed to brief were killed. And I was, as everyone else was, horrified by the events. And I went out to Washington, D.C. a couple months later to see him, to hug him. Uh, and we went to the memorial at the Pentagon, and we, we placed an American flag there. And um, then we were kind of driving around, and my cousin asked me, he said, well, this is your first time in D.C. Is there anything else you'd like to see? And I said, well, no, you. Uh, and he said, well, that's nice, but really, there's kind of a lot to see here. And I thought about it. You know, I've heard about this sculpture called Cryptos, which is at CIA headquarters. And um, he said, okay, where is it? And I'm like, well, it's CIA headquarters, and um, I know that's in Langley, Virginia. And he said, okay, well, let's get the address. Well, it's CIA. There's no street address. So... <laughs> So um, uh, what I did is I, I sort of looked around. There was no Google Earth at the time, and, um, but I did find some satellite reconnaissance pictures of the Langley, Virginia area, and I sort of knew what the building like, looked like because I'd seen like Tom Clancy movies where they'd like overhead view, and it was like CIA. Da -da -da -da. So I looked at those pictures until I found the, the outline of the building, and then you know, we went there. and. Uh, Nick and I, we, we thought we were just going to kind of, you know, go drive over and kind of like drive around the service road, you know, peek over the wall, and, but it, it doesn't work like that because <laughs> the, the, the road just goes right in there and there's nowhere else you can go and there's this big gate and there's barbed wire across the top and there's a guard shack and there's these big guys, big guys that come pouring out of the guard shack and they've got guns and they're asking very reasonable questions right after September 11th. Who are you and why are you here? And, and Nick and I are like, can we talk our way into CIA? So, <laughs> so we were like asking, is there, well, you know, we're just here to see cryptos. And the guards kind of relaxed and said, okay, yeah, but you can't get in. It's official business only. And we're like, is there like a public tour day? And the guy said, no, sorry. And I, well, can we ask our congressperson to give us, you know, like a letter of, of invitation? They said, sorry, no, official business only. We tried a couple other things. And like I said, these are big guys with guns. And, and so we finally kind of drove away. And, but I was thinking like mm, official business, official business. So now we kind of skip over to another part of my life at the time, or right after September 11th, is I was trying to see if I could help with the war on terrorism. And because I had all this experience with cryptography, I'd been cracking these hacker codes. So I called up the St. Louis FBI, and I said, can I help? And they said, no. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I kept calling them up, and, and they kept saying no. And I, my day job is I make computer games. And I had some dealings with fraud, because we had people coming in with, with fraudulent credit cards. And so every so often, I had to call the local FBI. And we'd talk about the credit cards. And I kept saying, can I help? Can I help? And finally, I got an agent who said, well, what is it that you know about? And I said, well, you know, I've cracked all these codes, and I've, you know, there's UU encoding and PGP and, and ROT13 and steganography and this. And, and he, he said, wait, stop. He said, steganography? And I said, yeah. And he says, you know, we've been hearing rumors that Al-Qaeda was using steganography as a way of planning the September 11th attacks. And um, steganography is a way of hiding a message inside of a picture. And so... Um, he asked me if I could put together a little talk about steganography for the local St. Louis, uh, kind of the meeting group of the different agencies. And so I, as I was putting this PowerPoint presentation together, I'm thinking, hmm, official business. <laughs> Maybe I can use this talk. And so in the talk, I did like some before and after pictures of this is a picture that doesn't have something hidden in it. This is a picture that does have something hidden in it. And I used a picture of the crypto sculpture that I'd gotten from the CIA website. And, and, so, uh, and every time I gave the talk, I'd say, boy, I'd love to give this talk at CIA someday. Boy, I'd love to give this talk at CIA someday. And so I'm at DEF CON. How many people know what DEF CON is? 
Okay, Def, yeah, you're in the electronics track. DEF CON, biggest hacker convention in the world, happens in Las Vegas. So I was in DEF CON, and I'd say, can I give my talk on steganography? And they say, well, okay, yeah, we need an alternate speaker here. So I went in, and, and so I'm in the Alexis Park Hotel, top of the hotel, big roof tent, and, um, I'm, uh, and I'm giving my talk, and boy, I'd love to give this talk at CI someday. And at the end of the talk, people come up, they give you business cards or whatnot, and somebody leaned across the table, and they looked me in the eye, and they said, I work at Langley. I think I can get you in. <laughs> so, so I got a first name and a phone number, and, um, and uh, they wouldn't give me a last name or anything. And so after DEF CON, I was saying, OK, uh, you know, was this really someone at CI, or is this just a hacker who was pulling my chain, right? So, so I called the phone number, and they said, yeah, yeah, we want you to you know, come send us your slides, and we'll, and we'll get you in to CIA. And, and I said, well, you have to prove that you really work at CIA. And they said, well, how am I supposed to prove that? And I said, well, send me an email from an official CIA email address. And they said, I don't have an email from an official CIA address. And I said, well, get an email from an official CIA address. So about two weeks later, I get an email from blah, 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 at ucia.gov, unclassified CIA.gov. So I write back to them to make sure that it was a real email address. It wasn't just something that was spoofed. And then we get two-way communication. and. Um, yeah, it all worked. I got an invite. I got to go in. I got to see cryptos. I got to do these rubbings of the sculpture. So that was Ilanka talking her way into CIA headquarters. So while I was, uh, when I came back to St. Louis, I put the rubbings on my website. It was sort of like an early blog. You know, here's Ilanka's visit to CIA, la da da. And I figured I was done with it at that point. No. I had people writing to me from all over the world who were saying, oh, you know about cryptos, and did you see this, and did you see that? And, and I'm like, hey, you, I, I just visited once. I don't know anything. You know? and, and they said, well, um, and, and uh, who made cryptos? And I said, well, it was Sanborn. And they said, well, what do you know about Sanborn? I'm like, I, I don't know. Um, he made cryptos. And what else has he done? I, uh, I don't know. So I called up Sanborn's agent, and I said, hey, can you send me a list of everything Sanborn's ever done? And they said, no, no one's ever made such a list. And I said, well, why not? And they said, it would be impossible to make a list of everything Sanborn's ever done. So I said, OK, I'll make a list of everything Sanborn's ever done. <laughs> and so I start writing to art galleries and, and asking them to, if Sanborn ever showed. And I said, well, do you have any extra programs from that? And they said, yeah, we got 12 and a rubber band in the back. I said, could you send me one? They said, we'd love to. So they'd send me the program, and I'd get the program, Sanborn, la da 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 on the back. Sanborn has also shown art at the following galleries. So then I would write to those galleries. And, and bit by bit, I had this huge a website that was growing along with an FAQ, a frequently asked question list of everything Sanborn's ever done. And, and so I'm, I'm putting all this there and, and researching as much as I can for this website. And I found out that in 1992, the NSA had uh, put a team together to work on crypto. So I was kind of interested on that. The, the first person to crack the first three parts was a man named Jim Gologly. This was in 1999. And, and that made international news. And then after that, the CIA came up and said, well, we have someone named David Stein who cracked those three parts just on his own time, working pencil and paper. And then that made international news. And then the NSA came forward and said, well, we have people that solved it too, but we're not going to tell you who, and we're not going to tell you when, which was very NSA, you know, no such agency. So, so, <laughs> so I found out about this, this thing that had happened where in 1992, the CIA's deputy director, William Studeman, had said to the NSA, OK, you guys think you're so hot. Let's see how hot you are. And so the head of the NSA took up the challenge. And they put together a four-person team to run some computer attacks. And they solved the, the first three parts in 1992. And then they sent their memo to the CIA. And I said, hey, I'd love to see that memo. And I got back from the NSA, we can't send you that memo. It's classified. To which I said, this is not a matter of national security. This is a recreational cipher. Why is it classified? And they said, well, you can't see it because it's classified. So I filed a Freedom of Information Act request <laughs> on the NSA to see, I want to see that memo. And so it, it was kind of this long thing. So it, I sent it to them, and, and I, they sent me back something that uh, saying, OK, are you willing to pay the search fees? And I said, yes, sure. And then in, in June 2010, they said, said, OK, the search is completed. You've been placed in the first in, first out processing queue for non-personal easy cases. But since there were several cases ahead of mine, they were unable to respond with 20 days. I said, no problem. 
six months later I write to them and they say okay the case is actively being worked but you know there's still it takes a long time because things are in review I said no problem six months later I write back to them I say how's it going they say the FOIA case is in the final approval stages I say cool six months later I write back to them they say you're in the final approval stages there are a number of cases ahead of yours in that queue so many of my friends who were in government agencies were telling me Ilanka this is NSA telling you go away <laughs> and I I said no <laughs> so I I kept writing to them every six months or so and then I got a big fat envelope that came out where I got to see the memo and everything and the NSA created a web page with information about the crypto sculpture I'm like cool and so I want to point out that in this big fat envelope there was at the very bottom it said approved for release by NSA on May 21st 2013 FOIA case 61191 that's me, okay? <laughs> thank you, thank you. So um, while, I was, while I was creating a list of everything Sanborn had ever done, I found out he had created another piece called the Untitled Crypto Speech. And I'll tell you what the first three parts say. Um, how am I doing on time, anybody? Right. Nope. Okay, I'll just keep going. Um, so he'd made this thing called the Untitled Cryptos Piece, which was in the home of a dot-com millionaire in California. So I called up the dot-com millionaire. I said, hi, I'm Ilonka. Uh, can I come into your backyard and see your sculptures? And they said, sure. So I got to go in and see it. And what this is, is it's a piece that has all of the text of cryptos on one side. And on the other side, it's a bunch of encrypted Russian text. Now, there's a larger version. So, so this is the one that's in the, the uh, back yard of the dot-com millionaire. Another piece, 20% 20 pe 20 larger, was created, and this is in the Hirshhorn Museum. So if you go to Washington, D.C., and the big round museum that's on the mall, this is the Hirshhorn Museum. This is outside, outside the door. Just kind of walk around. You'll see it. Can't miss it. So as I was looking at the piece that was in, in the backyard, right, the untitled cryptos piece, by the way, the Russian is also created, uh, is on another uh, sculpture called the un the, the Cyrillic projector, which is at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. So I found out that there are differences. So the sections are in a different order between cryptos and the untitled piece. And there's also these two dots. The dots are on the untitled cryptos piece. The, the letters are the same as what's on cryptos, but the dots are not. So come on. All right, I may need Scott because it just froze. Scott, OK. How do I shrink it back again? I need Scott to lay hands on it. Yeah, but it, I, I think it might get stuck again. Yeah, we did that. Now it froze again. Wait, no. OK. I have so many slides, so many slides. Is there a way to go to a certain yeah. slide? Oh, wait, we're almost there. Okay. And then it froze again. Okay, how, okay, we're good. Hey, see, all you need to be here, your aura. Okay, okay. Okay, all right, so this is crypto. So if the dots were there, they'd be about there. So I'm going to go over what it says very quickly. So it used a visionary system where you take the 26 letters of the alphabet, then you take a keyword, in this case the word cryptos, whereas that you just move the key over, the K and R and Y and all the letters. So you still have 26 letters. They're just scrambled in a very certain way. See, it goes B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, L, M, N, Q, S. Okay, So that's a key alphabet. All right, and then you can take that key alphabet and you can shift it by one and you get cryptos here and then you also get cryptos reading down the left hand column. Now imagine you do the same thing but you're spelling a different word down the left hand column so you're shifting all these alphabets by a different amount. So in this case we're going to spell the word palimpsest. Palimpsest is a word for a scroll that has had a message scraped off of it and another message put on it. So the first part one of cryptos Starts here, it's these top two lines. Okay. With the plain text between subtle shading and the absence of light, 
lies the nuance of illusion, a deliberate spelling by Sanborn. He said, but it's not what it is that's so important, it's where it is, it's the orientation or positioning. Part two is the rest of that top plate. This time the keywords are cryptos and abscissa. Abscissa is the x-coordinate of a graph. Plain text, it was totally invisible. How is that possible? They used the Earth's magnetic field, X. The information was gathered and transmitted underground to an unknown location. X, does Langley know about this? They should. It's buried out there somewhere. X, who knows the exact location? Only WW. This was his last message. X, 38 degrees, 57 minutes, 6.5 seconds north, 77 degrees, 8 minutes, 44 seconds west. ID by Rose. Actually, he made a typo in it, and he meant it to say X layer 2. Don't know what that means. Okay, then we have part 3. Starts at the top of this plate, goes down to about there. This one used a transposition system. All the letters are there. They're just scrambled via a very specific system. I won't go into the details on that. Uh, and it said, slowly, desperately slowly, the remains of passage debris that encumbered the lower part of the doorway was removed. With trembling hands, I made a tiny breach in the upper left-hand corner. And then, widening the hole a little, I inserted the candle and peered in. The hot air escaping from the chamber caused the flame to flicker, but presently details of the room within emerged from the mist. X, can you see anything? Q. Anyone recognize where that's from? King Tut, absolutely. This is a paraphrased extract from the diary of Howard Carter, November 26, 1922, on the day he discovered King Tut's tomb. And Sanborn had, had al always liked that passage, and so he carved it into cryptos. Part four, 97 characters, we don't know what it says. The artist has tried to help us. He's given us a couple hints. Um, now part four, by the way, is these bo four bottom rows here. Um, oh, uh, okay, before I get to that, I will tell you where do the coordinates point to. They point to right about there. Um, it's within the courtyard where Cryptos is. This is the new headquarters building, the reason they needed new sculptures. This white building with the funny UFO-shaped roof is the cafeteria. So as people or CIA employees are sitting in the cafeteria, they can look out the windows and they see this lovely landscaped area, and they see Cryptos, which is right there. And then again, the coordinates point to about there. There's nothing there. It's like lunch tables and stuff. There's another view. All right, duck pond, cryptos there. Coordinates point to here. Sanborn also did some other pieces out here. Big slabs, like they're tilted up out of the earth like a, a geologic forces, which is another one of the invisible forces he liked to show. Because there's three pieces. One, two, three. These also have sheets of Morse code that say things like SOS and shadow forces and lucid memory. There's also a compass there pointing to a lodestone, but I would point out that north on the compass does not point to north, and the needle is not pointing to north. Maybe significant, maybe not, we don't know. Okay, so it kind of shows where everything is. And then there's that one piece out there that doesn't have Morse code messages. We don't know what that means. Um, there's an extra L. This is one of the things that we're, we're looking at because that extra L is on the Cyrillic projector which points to one of the key words, Medusa, that is needed to solve the projector. Uh, now where is Medusa? It's on the third row up. Does something point to it? Yes, there's an extra bolt there which you can't really see from this side but if you look in from the other side it's very obvious. Don't freeze. Okay. Ed Scheidt um, is the man who taught Sanborn about codes. I've talked to him many times. He said, we solved the th first three parts without recovering the keys first. We had the benefits of the English language. He said, part four does use a little bit of steganography. We need to figure out the masking system before we can solve the code. But the part four does use all the letters. Um, now, Sanborn has given us hints. One of them is, at this section, that means the word Berlin. Um, we were all excited. He gave us a hint. Didn't help us. Um, <laughs> and like we find out, okay, we can get the word Berlin there if we use the, key, the same visionary system, but instead of cryptos and abscissa, we use the words like shifted and binary, which sounds really interesting. But then we found a lot of other key pairs could also produce the word Berlin right there. So again, may or may not be useful. 
Uh, then he gave us another hint, which is that right after Berlin, we have the word clock. So we did a lot of research on the different clocks that are in Berlin. Still, haven't, still hasn't helped us at all. So also, I would point out that there's some letters that are kind of out of alignment here. All right, you see them? Sanborn has seen this slide, and he has said this is important. But again, we don't know what that means. And he's also said this picture, he said that's the wrong side. That's the ugly side. And I'm like, OK, what's the correct side? And he said this one. This one is where you're looking at it from the front. Okay. Um, one of my theories was that at the time Sanborn was making cryptos was the time the Berlin Wall was coming down. So maybe uh, they, the CIA was in the process of making a, an installation to honor the Berlin Wall. They did put up a Berlin Wall monument in the CIA, but it's nowhere near cryptos. It's nowhere near those particular uh, coordinates. But maybe it was supposed to be near those coordinates. Also, before anybody gets too excited about this Berlin Wall piece that is not actual graffiti from the Berlin Wall, the CA got blank slabs and then hired an artist to put fake graffiti onto these slabs. Uh, as you can see, it's all in English. Okay, okay. Uh, the slabs are real. The slabs are real. All right, uh, so it, maybe they meant to put a Berlin Wall monument here. They ended up putting it over here, so we don't know. Uh, again, part four, we don't know. Uh, I was going to say a little bit about Da Vinci Code, because uh, um, Da Vinci, er, Cryptos is a theme through one of Dan Brown's novels. Um, and, and he puts hints like it says, only WW knows. This is hidden in the artwork of the book jacket for the Da Vinci Code. OK, and the animation's looking a little off, so we'll just skip that. And also, he put the coordinates. Uh, 37 degrees, 57 minutes, 6.5 seconds north. Also light red on dark red, hidden in the artwork for Da Vinci Code. All right, get through there. And then there's a novel, uh, Lost Symbol, um, at where cryptos is a recurring theme. I did help Dan Brown with the research for the novel, and then he named a character after me in the book. Uh, there's a character named Nola Kay, which is a sort of a scrambled version of Ilanka. Right. So why hasn't that fourth part, K4, been solved yet? It's short, only 97 characters. There might be a key on CIA grounds that we need. Uh, again, Cryptos was not created as a public challenge. It was created as a challenge to the employees at the CIA. We might have missed something. We might have been misdirected. May they, maybe the answer's not in English. Maybe it's in ancient uh, Babylonian or something. We, we don't know. Also, it's possible he messed it up, <laughs> that there's just a mistake that we don't know about. Um, uh, if you want more information, I do have a book on, on codes. Uh, there's a wonderful documentary at pbs.org slash NOVA. The, the, the URL changes from time to time. But if you Google NOVA Science Now and Cryptos, there's a really good documentary there. Um, some other articles I wrote in Secrets of the Lost Symbol. And if you just want to learn more about codes, Simon Singh's book, The Code Book, is excellent. Uh, if you want more information, uh, the brilliant David Kahn wrote a book, The Code Breakers, which goes into depth on lots of cryptography, uh, civilian and military. And there's a regular newsletter by Bruce Schneier, schneier.com, called Cryptogram, the telegram about codes, uh, that I highly recommend. It goes really into the, the high tech stuff. OK, questions? OK, so I will say one of the themes I hope you uh, take away is that there's a lot of codes out there. And people may keep telling you, you can't do it, but keep trying. And maybe you'll find something else interesting al along the way. Thank you. Thank you.